Hello and welcome to the Gaggle Book Challenge, and if necessary, destroying media narratives. I'm George Samueli. With me today, of course, is Buddy, and uh, uh, who is the co-founder of the Gaggle, and uh, his friend uh, Peter Lavelle. Um, so, so today, um, the Times of London has published an article jointly authored by uh, UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron, newly brought back to life by uh, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and the German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock. And, and, it, and this is aimed to impress us, right? Impress, impress us because, you know, these are the two most important uh, people uh, in Europe. I mean, if you, if you talk about foreign ministers, you know, somebody quick, you know, who's the French foreign minister? You know, people go, I, I, you know, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> the Italian foreign minister. So they, they're foreign ministers that who have some um, prominence in the world. Um, and the the title suggests, and even the the build up suggested that they were going to call for a ceasefire in uh, Gaza, which would have been a uh, a, a definite uh, turning point if uh, you know two the two uh, among the two biggest powers in Europe were now calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. But it turns out that that's not what they're saying in the article. And it's really a little more than essentially a gloss on what the United States is saying. Uh, so I want to just show you the um, the highlights or the lowlights of this um, uh, article. Um, and as you can see, the the headline, um, David Cameron, why the UK and Germany back a sustainable ceasefire. Note, notice they bring in this this adjective sustainable, which kind of takes away any um, weight from that word ceasefire, sustainable, you know, whatever sustainable is. And of course, then they, they explain to well, us. Well, of course, they want a sustainable ceasefire as opposed to an um, unsustainable. An unsustainable, exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, um, and, and then says the foreign secretary and his German counterpart call on all parties to work towards a two-state solution for Israel and Palestine once the killing has stopped. So this is, again, the the fig leaf, which the United States is also, oh, yeah, two-state solution, two-state solution. You don't really mean anything by it, but it's something you have to keep saying. Uh, to suggest that you are really interested in the peace process. Um, yeah, because uh, when when the killing is stopped, there might not be any Palestinians, so you right. don't have to worry about a two-state solution. Yes, exactly. Um, and then um, he says, "We know how many in the region. We know many in the region and beyond have been calling for an immediate ceasefire." You can see you can see where this is going as soon as you read that sentence. We recognize what motivates these heartfelt calls. It is an understandable reaction to such intense suffering, and we share the view that this conflict cannot drag on and on. And then you know there's a but coming. Um, and this is why we supported the recent uh, humanitarian pauses. And we saw at the end of November pauses work. So we are pushing the diplomatic effort to agree further pauses to get more aid in and more hostages out. So in other words, again, we get what we want, um, but nobody else does. So that's that's so that's our that's that's our goal. We'll have the humanitarian pauses so that we get what we want. We get our hostages out, uh, and then we get to do whatever we want to do. Um, and then, but, but let us be clear. We do not believe that calling right now for a general and immediate ceasefire, hoping it somehow becomes permanent, is the way forward. So there it is. Yes, I understand, you know, you'd, you'd like a ceasefire. It's very heartfelt. I understand you're very humane. We're very humane, too. Um, but we want a, um, something that's sustainable. And now is not the right time for anything sustainable. Well, I, I don't understand that. Stop. And stop, stop doing it. That's sustainable. <laughs> Just stop doing it. Yes. Stop doing it. Okay. Yeah. And if you do it over, you know, you repeat day after day after day, it could turn into something kind of general. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then you give the reason why to keep it that way. And that is something that's called the two state solution, 
which has become meaningless for at least last 25 years. It ignores why Israel is forced to defend itself. Hamas barbarically attacked Israel and still fires rockets to kill Israeli citizens every day. Hamas must lay down its arms. So now you can see how how abysmal this line of reasoning is. I mean, you know, the whole idea that uh, Israel is defending itself. Well, first of all, Israel is occupying land. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Israel has under international law, no right to uh, fire one bullet, exactly. one bullet in Gaza, because it is the occupying power. That's as right. a matter of fact, George, it has obligations as an occupying power, and that includes food, shelter, energy, and everything else that is necessary for sustainable modern life. They right. are obligated to do that. That's right. Now, That's right. You, George and I are saying this, and two other, two or three other people are saying this. Okay, but this is international law. Okay. Right. right. That that no, that's right. One should also remember that Resolution Two Four Two, which uh, declared that Israel has to withdraw from occupied territories, that was actually sponsored by the UK. Now the UK seems to have forgotten that, but it was actually sponsored by the UK. That's the Resolution Two Four Two. Um, well, Alan Dershowitz takes credit for it as well. I've seen him do that twice, at least. Okay. It's amazing all the things that he takes credit for. It's like, um, uh, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's right. He, he was involved in the, in, in the drafting of it. What, 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 what a guy. Um, anyway, so but, but then he says, Hamas barbarically attacked Israel and he still fires rockets to kill Israeli citizens. What what the hell is it supposed to do? I mean, you, they've, they've been pummeled now for more than two months, and there's oh, he's still firing. You you know you're still you're still firing. Now, anyone can see that there's no equality of arms between Israel and Hamas. I mean, there's no equality. I mean, it's 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 one sided. It's that's you know, why that's why George. I try to stay. I mean, sometimes I slip, but sometimes most of the time I stay away from the Israel Israel Hamas conflict because no, this is a war on Gaza. Right. That's right. Okay? That, that, yeah. That, 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 that's that's right. Um, and I think that um, John Mearsheimer said recently that really what what you have is a, a greater Israel in yes, which. Not. Hamas um, is is waging resistance uh, yes. to the occupying power. So the, 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 it's not like Hamas is a state. Hamas is not a state party. It's just a resistance uh, force in Greater Israel. Hamas must lay down its arms. Well, so and and then you know er, er, you know Israel gets to do whatever it wants. What? That, why are you even bothering writing this? I mean, you know, we can get all this from Tel Aviv. I mean, I mean, we don't need the, you to say this. We, everything we should do, get everything that we want. Well, fine. I, I'll, I'll get my hand out then from Tel Aviv. Well, it, it, it sounds like the the, the Zelensky uh, peace plan. Okay, Russia must withdraw from all occupied territory. It must um, uh, put itself forward to the ICC and pay reparations. Well, that, that's a plan, but I mean. How realistic is it? I think right. it's you know it's a, it's a ridiculous talking series of talking points. Keep That's going. Right. That's right. Let us imagine that we did press Israel to cease all military operations forthwith. No, that's unimaginable. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just unimaginable. Would Hamas stop firing rockets? Would it release the hostages? Would its murderous ideology change? Well, we could say that um, it might be a start. Yep. Stop military operation. Point two withdrawal from Gaza, point three, um, ending the blockade. Now, if you do those things, then maybe we can ask uh, answer those questions. Would Hamas stop firing rockets? Would it release the hostages? Would its murderous ideology change? I mean, you can't just say, well, yes, if you just simply stop shooting, maybe it's not going to stop. But um, if you do some other things, which which would make life bearable for the people of Gaza, then then we can talk. But just simply saying, oh well, they wouldn't they wouldn't do it. So therefore, let's not even bother because Hamas isn't going to uh, you know respond to this. An unsustainable ceasefire quickly collapses, collapsing into further violence would only make it harder to build the confidence needed for peace. Well, that's really very nice. Because in other words, um, you know, again, well. You, to Israel, you got to do what you got to do. Just keep keep doing it. 
um, because otherwise we get an unsustainable ceasefire. So, you know, then don't even bother with any kind of uh, ceasefire. Just keep doing it. Well, uh, I mean, just to slightly repeat what George said earlier is that, OK, uh, if they really want a general and immediate ceasefire, then end the blockade. OK, allowed aid to come in. That, those are two first basic steps. OK, that, and that would create a to build the confidence needed for peace. But you know, Hamas is b being asked to do everything. Israel is asked to do nothing. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, we must also think carefully about the nature of any long term peace deal. <laughs> well, we have to think. That hasn't been done before. <laughs> Even before October the 7th, it was hard to imagine Hamas as a real partner for peace. Well, uh, it's not up to you really to decide, you know, who is your partner for peace and who isn't. I mean, it's like, well, they're, you know, they, they run Gaza. They won an election. OK, you can say there hasn't been any election since then, but, but it's, it's, also, been under under, blockade, it's also been under a blockade. But you don't get to decide who represents the people of Gaza. I mean, that's, that's well, it, what you say. You're saying, well, oh, well, we, weren't, we weren't Hamas. But Israel doesn't get to decide who whom it, it, it regards as proper rep. And Israel has been doing that for decades, as to decide who are the proper representatives of the Palestinian people. Well, it was because of uh, Israeli behavior and decision making that Hamas came to power in Gaza. Right. Yeah. Yes, that's right. After October the 7th, we can have no illusions. Leaving Hamas in power in Gaza would be a permanent roadblock on the path to a two-state solution. <laughs> Why? This magic, oh, the path to a two-state solution, which, you know, Israel doesn't even pretend. It doesn't even pretend any longer that it has any interest. It never really had any interest in a two-state no. solution. But, but it doesn't even bother pretending. They openly say, we're not interested in any two-state solution. Well, it, particularly since Hamas came about as a result of the lack of interest on the part of Israel to have a two-state solution. Right. That, that, I mean, this is the... This is the foreign minister and the uh, of, of the UK and of and Germany. Germany. Yeah. They are, are they actually writing this again? <laughs> this is this is first year university stuff. Well, okay? yeah, but but I mean first year universities, but it's being it's drafted by the State Department. You know, here here it is. You know, oh, we'll just fax this. Well, we don't have faxes anymore. We'll just uh, send it over to you, um, and you put you can put your name on top. You know, David Cameron and, and Annalena Baerbock. Can um, add add a picture if you want. That's right. Um, but this is this is the nonsense that the United States has been peddling uh, all, all this time. You know, well, we want a two state solution, but we can't have Hamas. Um, so Israel gets them to decide who represents Gaza. Well, that's not acceptable. You're not going to get any kind of a, a deal if you get to decide who speaks on behalf of um, uh, the people of Gaza. We cannot expect Israelis to live alongside those dedicated to repeating the horrors inflicted by Hamas. Let's say, again, the horrors inflicted by we're, we're still going to be stuck forever in October the 7th. You know, the, the, yeah, everything was hunky dory, George, on October 6th. Yeah, exactly. Yes. But, you know, again, this is the we cannot expect Israelis to live along, uh, alongside. Well, they the people of Gaza have been forced to live alongside right. a murderous regime. Right. Since the Hamas took power in Gaza, what th this is the this is the fourth or fifth right. attack. Okay, depending on how you define it. Okay, yeah. but I mean they have been forced to live alongside this. Right, right. Um, um, and we cannot expect Palestinians to live among those who endanger them by lurking under their homes, schools, and hospitals. Oh, that, that's so nice of you. To, you care so much about the Palestinians. We can't expect the Palestinians. You, know, you just love them so much. Um, we can't expect the Palestinians to live among those who endanger them um, by lurking under their homes, schools, but and this hospitals. Is, this is time-honored Orientalism, okay? Palestinians have no agency. They're they're uh, like a childlike group of people. They don't know what's best for them. They don't understand their own interests. That is so patently absurd, and it is essentially at its core very racist, to be honest. Well, the, the point is that they, um, uh, you know, this was just this was the Israeli argument. The Israeli argument was always, well, we're not going to deal with the Palestinians, and then we're going to um, 
uh, appoint. Remember, they, they appointed these various Palestinians who said, well, these are the representatives of the Palestinian people. It was, it was, it was so ridiculous that after a while, even the Israelis had to abandon that. They finally decided, OK, and that took decades and decades. They decided um, that, well, maybe the PLO does speak on behalf of the Palestinians. But then, he, they, then they immediately started trying to assassinate Yasser Arafat, and they finally obviously uh, succeeded. So, you know, that, that was, you know, then they've got this, this character, Abbas. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Not, not quite sure what he's doing. Um, but Nobody does. Okay. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and he has the unique um, um, privilege, if you can use that word, of being just as about as unpopular as Benjamin Netanyahu. Yes, that's right. Um, anyway, so we must do all we can to pave the way to a sustainable ceasefire. You know, again, it's very, very nice. You know, they, they're using this word. This is, it's one of, it's known as a weasel word. It essentially takes out, takes away the meaning. It's a modifier, but it takes away all meaning from the, what's modified. Just a, so you have a ceasefire. Oh, people notice that word ceasefire. They don't pay any attention to this, uh, this cr creepy adjective, sustainable, leading to a sustainable peace. The sooner it comes, the better. The need is urgent. We are also focused on three vital areas. First, like any country in the world, Israel has the right to defend itself. But in doing so, it must abide by international uh, humanitarian law. Um, but again, as you know, we've talked about before, you may have a right to defend yourself. You don't have a right to occupy um somebody else's uh territory um so you know so which is what israel has been doing so just saying oh they have the right to defend themselves which is why they're always stuck on this october the 7th they don't, they don't really want to talk about anything else israel will not win this war if its operations destroy the prospect of peaceful coexistence with the palestinians you think um, yeah, and, <laughs> and you think that um that they, you know, that they, there's still peaceful coexistence uh, possible. Didn't Alan Dershowitz, I think, in that debate with Norman Finkelstein, I think, put forward that yeah, we, the, you know, the model of Germany, you know, Germany after World War II and, and Japan, yeah, they that peaceful coexistence. So we'll have peaceful coexistence uh, afterwards. Um, yeah, but but you know, it, it it's it's such a, f a flaccid, in so many different ways. It's a it's a terrible comparison. Germany had a state japan had a state okay and it was internationally recognized okay palestine by the western world does not see that the palestinians have a state okay so comparing a, a group of people under occupation to a full-fledged state like germany and japan right. well why don't we compare you know apples and and vapes, George. Okay, I mean it's. No, I, I, I I agree, and I think that it was always obvious in 1945 that there was an entity called Germany that was separate and distinct from the Hitlerite regime. And, that, you know, and you had to sign a treaty with it, right? Right, right, the exactly. State so that's of right. Germany. That's right, and and you know basically that. Um, you know, there had existed a Germany before uh, World War Two, a Germany before World War One. Um, that that Germany you could you could negotiate with and agree upon. You know, Hit, Hitler, the Hitlerites were not the same as Germany. It was obvious again with in that case. And, so that's why to say that. Really... Oh well, there was nothing to do. I mean, it's it was it was ridiculous. I mean, it was obvious even then that this is these are two separate uh, things. Billy Brandt was there. We had Adenauer was there. These people had existed. Prior, in, 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 particularly Adenauer, he was the mayor of Cologne before the Nazis came to power. That's, he, this guy lived forever. He was a biblical age. Okay, and so what, and that's it. And what happened with Germany, with Japan? They got rid of the military junta because J even Japan had a, par a parliamentary democracy before it went fascist. What did they turn to? They turned to that. Palestinians don't have any of that. Right. No. The, the, exactly. Um... And it says that they, they have a right to uh, um, eliminate uh, the threat uh, posed by Hamas. And I think that that's, you know, exactly right. I mean, the, with the Palestinians is that, um, yeah, I mean, pretty much their history is made up of being rendered stateless. I mean, yes. the idea that, oh, well, there's some, there was some Palestinian entity. Then, yeah, then you could say a Palestinian entity 
that you can go back to and say, oh, that's fine. That's the um, that's the, the the continuity of the state of Palestine. But you don't. I mean, the, the entire history is a constant is constantly being uh, shunted from one place to another and, uh, and and told where they can go, where they can't go, who who can speak on their behalf, who can't. Then they say, oh, well, yeah, but we're going to make peace with them. It's just going to be like uh, like Germany and Japan. So. Um, Anyway, they, they have a right to eliminate the threat posed by Hamas, but too many civilians have been killed. You think? Well, um, yeah, it's very interesting. Too many civilians. So, uh, according to the latest estimate, what you know, let's say there have been nineteen thousand killed. We don't know how many of them are civilians. A very high proportion of, of, of civilians. Um, but you're still talking about October the seventh, uh, and it's a, you know, which and and those numbers, incidentally, of October the seventh. They're going to be keep revising downwards. You know, you you just watch how they're going to be. They've already been revised down to twelve hundred. I think they've been revised to a thousand. You just watch how 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 many more revisions downwards. Uh, well, and, 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 and if we ever if we ever hear the the um, a transparent rendition, historical rendition, how many of those people were killed by the Israeli military? Exactly, exactly. Um, the Israeli government should do more to discriminate sufficiently between terrorists and civilians, ensuring its campaign targets Hamas leaders and operatives. Oh. Well, they've, they've, you know, they've been doing a fantastic job in doing well, that. Do more. You got to do more. It's it's one of these things that you know you and I have been watching over the years. Is if you look what people are saying inside of Israel. Um, as opposed to what is allowed to be said in the West, particularly the Anglo-Saxon countries, the English-speaking countries, is that if you look at the leaders, um, um, the political elite uh, of Israel, uh, they, they're interested in not quality, they're interested in quantity. They want to destroy as much as possible. These are all publicly aired. They're, they, they're not ashamed. They're not embarrassed right. by their genocidal language. But, you know, Berbach and, and Cameron, they pretend as if that those people are not saying the things that they are. Right. They're, they're being really dishonest with their public. That's right. It's very interesting, again, because what, what are their motives? Now, Germany, Germany's got this bizarre view of, of the Middle East, refusing, incidentally, to take responsibility that they, more than anyone else, have you know created this problem for the Palestinians? The Palestinians <laughs> didn't instigate any kind of Holocaust against the Jews, and then after World War II, Germany poured a lot of money into Israel. I mean, they've been you know paying, paying, and paying, which helped strengthen the Israeli state. So that you know, the Palestinians have a lot of beef against the uh, the Germans, um, but nonetheless, the way Germany interprets it, you know, or we we have to kind of uh, you know atone for ourselves by essentially uh, associating ourselves with you know one bunch of uh, you know uh, uh, murderous thugs and against um, uh, the the victims. So you know, and and you know that's how they think of atonement. Well, you know, just to be fair, yeah, the German state from 1939 to 1945 wrecked havoc in Europe, okay? It was a murderous regime. It dislocated, dispossessed tens of millions of people. Those people, all right, you got a beef with the German state. I can, I get it, but it doesn't mean Germany is obliged to create another state right. for other people. But, but There's this no is, obligation there. Right, but this is the interesting thing because Germany hasn't paid restitution to other countries, and they nope. never paid anything to Poland. Certainly, didn't pay much to the Soviet Union. Um, Israel is a different case. Israel it has paid a lot of money to um, Israel, which came, of course, at the uh, expense of the uh, the Palestinians. And and yet, all of this has been justified by the typical German self righteousness. Yeah, but, but in the Second World War in Europe ended in 1945. Israel yeah. became a state in 1948. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's so what is its obligation to Israel? It, it, it doesn't. And that's that that's in fact the thing. I mean, they say, oh, well, you know, because of the Holocaust, we have an obligation for the state of Israel. Well, that's that's Germany's uh, interpretation. The Palestinians may say, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> you, you know, you, you should have you have an obligation to us since we are paying the price for what you did, uh, creating so many refugees um, and, and then 
creating the whole atmosphere at the United Nations after World War II that we have to uh, do something uh, to atone for the terrible things that were, that were done to the Jews during World War II. So the Palestinians, yeah, Palestinians have, have a beef. But the British is a kind of an, an interesting case because the British had, um, you know, had, had a very good relations with the Arab world. And they were by no means uh, in, in the Israeli uh, uh, tank. Um, you know, they remember the, the terrorist acts of the Irgun, uh, the Stern gang, who, Stern gang. who um, uh, you know, assassinated um, British officials. The, you know, the bombing of the King David Hotel. So a lot of, a lot of people were killed in that bombing. Um, and the British were very unhappy about that. And yet, and yet it seems like all of that has been uh, has well, been forgotten, and the okay, British Hamas is a terrorist the group. Americans. Hamas is a terrorist group, but the, the Stern gang wasn't. Of course, it was. It was even deemed, deemed as one at the time. At the time, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, anyway, so it says second, we must get more aid to ordinary Palestinians. Yes, we must. It breaks our hearts to see children in the rubbles of their destroyed homes, not knowing where to find food or water, not knowing where their parents are. It, 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 yeah. We have, we have both therefore increased our funding for humanitarian aid to Gaza, getting life-saving supplies to those in desperate need. Yeah, so but this, if you can't get it in, what is it worth, okay? Right, but it's all, I, I always, I always, this is always delightful, you know, that Israel does all this, it boom, boom, destroys, pummels away, um, creating these humanitarian disasters, and then somebody steps in with the humanitarian aid. It's a, it's a nice deal. Israel doesn't come up with any humanitarian. I mean, at no point does Israel say, "Well, you know, we're going to do something for the Palestinians." You know, we're going to send in some first aid trucks, and we're going to send in um, food and water. You know, some of those beautiful uh, oranges and the grapefruits that they're always proud of, and you know, the, let, let's you know send in some uh, grapefruit. Uh, no, it, it's always up to uh, the Europeans who have to uh, to do all this. Um, we the, and then so uh, we have both therefore increased our funding for humanitarian aid to Gaza. We need unhindered deliverers into Gaza directly via as many crossing points as possible, so that much greater volumes of aid start flowing. Well, okay, good good luck with that. Um, and then finally. All those who want to end the suffering need to work together on a solution that delivers long-term security for both peoples. Our Arab partners in particular have a critical role to play in this. They have uh, shown strong humanitarian commitment and they have even more political weight to bring to the table. Well, you know, um, uh, the Americans have far more ability to influence things than our Arab partners. The Americans enable Israel. I mean, that's, you know, then you, you have the ability to influence things. Not quite sure what the your Arab partners can actually do. Um, you know, they can, they can, you know, draft UN General Assembly resolutions, UN Security Council resolution. They can draft those. But what, what, what's the point of that? But it's nice. Oh, well, our Arab partners. Let, let's just show how, how multicultural we are. You know, we'll just, you know, our good, our good friends, uh, the Arabs. Well, hey, it's within your power to 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 do something about it, not up to them. Absolutely, the, you know the it's it's really quite extraordinary that they don't, so far anyway they haven't mentioned the United States once, have they? Not once, not once, not once. Um, and um, and then it says the rise of extremism is a threat to all of us, not just to Israelis and Palestinians. A two-state solution requires both sides. To feel safe living side by side. You know, again, two sides. So you got, you know, you got one side. There's symmetry here. There's symmetry. Exactly. The two, yeah, exactly. Um, notice how, you know, the, the whole idea that, you know, that living safe, living side by side. If Israel had been really serious about a two state solution, the Palestinians would probably have gone for a demilitarized state. You know, basically, sure. the, a, a, a Palestinian state would be demilitarized. You know, essentially have no arms at all. They would have gone for it. Yep. Um, that so that was never the sticking uh, sticking point that oh they have to be feel safe um, living side by side. Um, yeah, but but you know again you know the, living side by side. Well, one has a state, and yes. it has 
It's a very powerful state and it's protected, all right? Another is not a state. It's a people under occupation. But you always get, you know, you, there's always this theme that there is somehow a sense of equality of both sides. Right. And there's none. Right. And that's what's so frustrating all the time. Right, right. that's right, exactly. And then, and then, and, and this has now become the favorite bugaboo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this shows that the, you know this. They really care. Okay, it, you know it. I, it's really interesting. It, not after you know before October seventh, George. This year was the most deadly year in decades for the West Bank. Okay, right. so this is this trend is only accelerated. Right. Keep going. That's it. Extremist settlers in the West Bank. So let's let's bash these extremist settlers on the West Bank to show how. Uh, fair-minded we are. Extremist settlers in the West Bank are seeking to sabotage any such effort. See, we, you know, we're not. Don't, don't accuse us of being one-sided and pro-Israeli. No, we're we're bashing these settlers. How did the settlers get there? Who is enabling the settlers? Who's subsidizing the settlers? Uh, you know, <laughs> who allows the settlers to work uh, uh, work beyond the bounds of the law? Right, exactly. Who provides the you know the protection uh, of the, of the settlers? Um, and, and so, oh no, we'll get oh extremists. So some some few crazy people. Now, Tony Soprano would really understand the settlers well. Right. That's he right. really would. Okay. Yeah. Um, the settlers are violently forcing Palestinians from their homes. Well, this has been going on for years. I mean, violently forcing Palestinians from their homes. You know, imagine that. Never before. Of Palestinians being violently forced from their homes. It's uh, I'm appalled. I'm, I'm, frankly, I'm just appalled. We strongly condemn such hateful acts. And then the Palestinians need a team of leaders who can give them the security and good governance they deserve. I nominate Tony Blair. I think Tony Blair <laughs> should be the leader of the Palestinians. And you know, and, and um, the Finchick, the Finchick. And then William Hague, you remember that guy, the former UK foreign secretary? Weird looking guy. Very, yeah. very, he was a very weird I, guy. I think that, you know, the, 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 you know, geneticists will have a field day with him. <laughs> That's right. Yes, I, I, this is the team that we should, you know, put together to represent uh, the, the, the Palestinians. We need to guarantee that the violence we are seeing is never repeated. That is the only route to lasting peace. During such a crisis, it can seem difficult to think of such a seemingly distant endpoint, but we must. We want fighting to cease, not just today, but in the future. We want an end to the killing, not just today, but in the future. We want peace for Israeli and Palestinian children, exactly today and in the future. Well, so, everybody, you know why Cameron isn't prime minister? <laughs> um, <laughs> this, you know, to use a, this dumb cough, okay? Dumb cough, yes, exactly. Dumb cough. Um, that's a, that's a, uh, gonna be again. These are the two most prominent foreign ministers of Europe, and essentially they're repeating all of the American talking points because we know what Biden and, and his people are doing is pretending that they're interested in a two state solution, they're pretending that they're urging is restraint on Israel, uh, they're pretending. That uh, they they've, they've, you know they very have problems with these West Bank settlers. You know that we don't we don't like these West Bank settlers, um, but it's 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 a show. It's it's an absolute you know. George, this is in writing, <laughs> in a major broadsheet. This is a act of absolute pure desperation. Right. Is that they realize that they are all culpable in this. You can't run away from it now. You're all of your fingerprints are all over this. And you're going to be that these people are going to have to live the rest of their lives because they tied themselves to this. George is absolutely right. There is no call for a ceasefire in this ridiculous right. article. Right. Okay. Right. It's what Hamas has to, you know, surrender or, you know, shoot themselves, you know, walk into the ocean, you know, what they have to do all of those things. Right. But Israel isn't required to do anything whatsoever. You know, you know, calm those, those settlers, you know, calm them down a little bit. Okay. You know, right. no, no, no um, uh, due process, no, no rule of law. And the, the, where was that in the article, George? It wasn't. Right. No, no, uh, there's none of that. It's basically, um, you know, the fig leaf. So we're, say, we're basically giving a blank check to Israel, but let's pretend that we're interested in a ceasefire. Let's pretend we're interested in a uh, two-state solution. Let's pretend that we're actually even-handed 
in what we're doing. And let's pretend that we're not actually just parroting uh, everything that the Americans are saying. It, it, it's absolutely uh, transparent. Um, and it's really quite contemptible that, um, that the British and the Germans have now so completely identified themselves with the Americans. I mean, even the French haven't quite done that. You know, well, of course, with Macron, it's always, you know, what yeah, I no, say no. on Monday has nothing to do with, <laughs> with what I say on Tuesday. But nonetheless, I, I think it is interesting that the French foreign minister, <laughs> whose name escapes me right now, um, hasn't, you know, didn't join in with this. Uh, well, I, I want to know why Burrell wasn't on that. Yeah, Bur yeah that, that, that's right. Burrell, the EU. Uh, foreign minister. So, uh, yeah, but George, don't you have the impression? And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to make light of this here, but I, my gut tells me this was written in the State Department. I think so. I think so. Um, and, you, gotta, you, know, you gave him a call. You know, got to pitch in, pitch in. It's coming over. Okay, that's right. We, we already, we already talked to was it Financial Times. He said, was this, this, is, this is the Times. The, the Times. It was published. I think the Times and. Uh, a, a German newspaper. I, can't, I think it was the Welt am Sonntag. I think it was that that a German newspaper as well. Um, uh, but but it, it's it's again, you know, the I, you remember when um, just before Libya, they 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 started bombing Libya. Uh, I think they also there was a, an article I think signed by Cameron, Obama, and uh, Sarkozy. Um, absolute pack of lies, you know, so oh, it's all humanitarian, and we are not doing regime change. This is not about removing Gaddafi. No, 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 it's nothing to do with that. We're trying to save lives. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that was... That, well, that was yeah. You know, but I mean, you would think that the two most important foreign policy, official foreign policy figures in Europe would address the, the overwhelming um, claim of genocide. But they won't address that issue, okay? They won't address it. I mean, I I would like Burrell to address it because he would he would say this is not about genocide, and then he would prove it is because that's exactly what he argues all the time. But they don't talk about what is happening on the ground at all. They're talking about um, um, paradigms, and you know, we we looking back, looking like we're scholars. We remember the past, the two state solution. Well, is there any? Um, Anything said in that article that makes the the even pressing the issue of a two state solution even possible anymore? Did no, they name how many settlers are in the West Bank? No, they don't. That, 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 that's the point. You just you, it's it's one of these things you just invoke um, to to feel good about yourself. Oh well, yeah, yeah, we we want a two state solution. Um, you have no idea at all. No no plans at all. How are you going to get there? I mean, where you know the, you know what what are the steps that you're going to take now that you didn't take? I mean, this has been talking about since Oslo. Oslo is now thirty years ago. So what what are you going to do now to get to this two state solution? You say, oh, we don't want Hamas, but Hamas hasn't been. You know, that wasn't the problem. Why haven't we got to this two state solution that was envisaged in 1993? That has nothing to do with Hamas. They think, oh, we'll just we we'll just get rid of Hamas and somehow all the problems will be solved. You know, it's totally magical and deeply dishonest uh, thinking. Yes, but the whole Oslo process was predicated on creating a two-state solution. And Benjamin Netanyahu has been very public about it. His entire political career is that he wants the end of Oslo. And the Oslo ended a long time ago. If it wasn't pro forma, it just lapsed, okay? Because you ended up having the uh, the Palestinian Authority as being their enforcers in the West Bank, okay? And, and Palestinians know that, okay? So what is the predicate? I mean, we have to build upon Oslo, we have to build upon Camp David, or, or, or no, if, it's a new idea, if it's a new idea, what is the new idea? No, there isn't, that, and that's the point. So you just simply in, invoke something that sounds very good, you know, like Bernie Sanders, you know, oh, we got to get, get rid of Hamas, and now we got to a two-state solution, we got to get a two-state solution, and then you just see, keep repeating it. That makes you sound a very reasonable person. Yeah, yeah, and then, you know, well, that's good. And then with people like Bernie Sanders, or kind of figures on the left, you know, they also dump on Benjamin Netanyahu, because that's easy, that's safe. Yeah, and nobody but, likes him. Yeah, so. I mean, you know, hey, he's a far right and whatever. But the point is, 
Israel from the beginning, even Rabin, who had negotiated the uh, the, the Oslo Agreement, signed uh, you know famously with Clinton on the lawn of the uh, the White House. Even Rabin was never really serious about a, a two state solution. Um, but, but 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 then you know you know Israel even you know gradually stopped pretending. You know, uh, now they're openly saying there was not there isn't going to be a two state solution. So how do they plan to do this? Because because anybody knows that what's standing in the way of a two state solution is that you've got this massive part of the West Bank occupied by the settlers. How is this going to be part of a Palestinian state when it's actually wedded to the Israeli state? This part, this, this part of the West Bank is a part of the Israeli state. So how is this going to be part of this two state solution? Well, they, that, that, that's and when this all started, um, since, talking about this since October seventh, is that this is what's been infuriating to me is, is that there. Why would anyone even talk about a two state solution when Israel has done everything in its, in its uh, power to make sure one doesn't come about? Okay, and we know this by trying when we saw Israel trying to normalize relations with Saudi Arabia and other countries, saying that you know the the Palestinian issue has been resolved. Jared Kushner, I mean, you and I talked about this many times. So his you know his great um what, what did he call it? you know the, the um, you, is it the new middle east or something like yeah that? the new middle east or well, whatever it was here and and you and i've said it repeatedly um over the years is that oh well if the, if you don't mention the palestinians then it's no problem it doesn't exist and this is exactly what we got okay this is how we got here well that's right? the thing that um you know the people say okay the two-state solution that isn't um viable but the one-state solution that isn't viable there's no way in the world that that you can have a one state solution. I mean, you, where basically the Jews will become a minority within this greater greater Israel state. I mean, it cannot happen. I mean, it's not going to happen. So basically, you don't have a one state solution. You don't have a two state solution. Then the only is the no, the no state solution, and that would involve, of course, you know, pushing all the other well, Palestinians. What down. we have is one one people left standing. That's what the solution that right. Israel is pushing. One people left standing. Right, but the, but that that state, you know, that that you know, in this the the whole idea that you could have a binational state that c cannot be. You know, there's no way in the world Israel would accept that, where the Jews would become a minority in their own state. They're not they're not just going to give give that up. I mean, that ca that cannot be. So so we don't you don't get anywhere. And but instead of realizing that, uh, and they say, well, you got to do something because you can't have a one state solution. You can't have a two state solution. So what are you going to do about this? They, they just oh well, let's let's make it all about Hamas and let's make it about no, yeah, no, the, 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 talking about the two state solution is just a switch in bait. It's a switch in bait. They're, none of them are serious about it. First of all, most of them don't know anything about it. Obviously, that article tells us that. Okay, I don't know what uh, State Department functionary wrote it. Okay, but you you left out all of the context. Good job. Okay, that I guess that was the point. No context. All right. But they, they, let's talk about two, two state solution. Meanwhile, George, on the ground, something very different is happening. OK, and that's why they're doing it. OK, they're trying to absolve their conscience. You know, as the Palestinians were being slaughtered, we were pushing for a two state solution. They're yeah. trying to absolve themselves. You can't. Yeah, yeah, no, I, uh, that's right. Um, I mean, I, I think they would have been better off not writing this. I, I, so they, th they thoroughly discredited themselves. I mean, absolutely. Um, Cameron, uh, you know, I mean, bringing him back, I mean, it, it still it remains, and it becomes an even greater mystery. What what problem did, did bringing him back solve? I mean, what 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 issue was there before that needed to be addressed by the return of David Cameron? Because he's as ludicrous, as pathetic, and as as buffoonish and incompetent as he was when he was prime minister, uh, and yet he's back. Uh, you know, with with this vapid uh, nonsense, and he hooks his train with to Annalena. Wow, but <laughs> boy, they, he's slumming. He is really slumming. Okay, and Annalena Baerbock, you know, I mean, she's up to her neck with, with Ukraine. We're at war with Russia. We're not. You know, we shouldn't fight each other. We're at war with Russia, and then and, and then just embracing um a zionist ideology okay and, and embracing zionist israel okay I, I i do they understand really the implications of what they're doing i don't know okay 
uh, because the, uh, the cadre quality today is so low. The bar is so very low. Right. So, I, you know, this, you know, um, you know, this return to the, the center of power, um, I think he's going to embarrass himself even more. OK, yeah. So, I mean, he fundamentally misunderstood Brexit. And now you bring in this guy to yeah. you know, solve the world's problems in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, of course, you know, in, in Britain, you got you got these massive demonstrations that take place um, every every uh, week. Um, but Cameron hasn't done anything to uh, to appease us because they, you know they're not that stupid. When they say we want an immediate ceasefire, they don't say no. We want a sustainable ceasefire. In other words, we want a ceasefire that comes. Um, after Israel has accomplished its goals, which we, have have, we haven't specified, and that, that and that will call as a proper ceasefire. Well, not really. So, you know, if, you know, Cam maybe Cameron may think that somehow by saying, "Well, I, yeah, I want a ceasefire, but you know, a sustainable ceasefire," uh, you know, he, he makes himself look, you know, he, even more ridiculous than before. Can he just kill fewer people? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the assumption is killing people is okay. Just don't kill so many of them, okay? Particularly since the majority appear to be women and children. Right. Right. And, and you know, it, it's something that you know. It's so different, or slightly different this time. Is that you can see what's going on? There are plenty, and but, but particularly one news outlet is you know Al Jazeera, which they're doing a, a fabulous job there. You can just watch one hour of it. Just just one hour. I tell I, I I tell my American friends that I said just watch it for one hour and tell me what you think. Okay, just one hour. I mean, it's horrific, and you know, and and Cameron is saying, you know, it, um, and, and until we get a sustainable ceasefire, this is going to continue. I mean, what kind of moral stance is that? No, no, that's right, and I think that. That's you know the the interesting aspect. I mean, what they mean by sustainable ceasefire, and they say, well, yeah, when you presumably what eliminated all Hamas leaders. All right, what's then, you know, how how many civilians do you envisage should have been killed at that point when you've eliminated the Hamas leaders? You know, five hundred thousand. I mean, in other words, what what is what you call a sustainable ceasefire? What's on the acceptable? level of uh civilian casualties you don't you know just simply saying oh well we got rid of, get rid of the hamas leaders well i mean they've been they, they israel's been saying we've been we're killing these hamas leaders but apparently you're not really <laughs> you're not you're not getting very far since that you you're still doing this since more than two months and there's no end in sight so obviously you're not killing uh hamas leaders so when you've killed off all the hamas leaders and the whole hamas infrastructure What's the civilian uh, casualty that you think is fine and, and is perfectly acceptable well, to you, how many were Annalena these and David? Annalena and David, how many of these children work for Hamas? Yeah. Well, you have a number for us? Okay. Yeah. I mean, and this is what it's all about. And again, I just think it's all a cover for, and they know, you know, they can say that, you know, Israel has to be more precise. Okay. But I mean, if you're the Israelis, and they're not going to cut off the money. They're not going to cut off your diplomatic cover. Well, why would you change your behavior? No, because no, really we have not. we have Annalena Baerbock and David Cameron legitimizing right. what we're doing. Right. No, that, that, that exactly. There's no, you know, why 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 would why would you change? I mean, there's no no reason to, uh, to change at all. I mean, just keep keep doing it. Um, I mean, they can publish these uh, articles and then, and then the, the Biden people can leak things to the New York Times. You know, we're very unhappy with um, the way Israel is carrying on. I, we told them, we've told them before, don't do it. Don't, uh, you know, kill so many people. We keep saying it. They're not listening to us. And, uh, you know, keep, keep, you just, you know, then what, what can we do? They're not listening to us. So, you know, they can go on peddling these uh, ridiculous stories. But the Israelis, you know, they look at this, well, you know, why, why shouldn't we continue uh, going ahead? I mean, the easiest thing is for them to actually get on the phone, not to the, to the New York Times, but to um, Netanyahu and saying, that's it, you know, we're cutting you off. I mean, you know, the, we just can't take this anymore. That would That would get their attention. But, you know, leaks to the New York Times, that doesn't get anyone's uh, attention. No, it shows their weakness. 
It shows their we uh, incredible weakness and the inability to be decisive. And I think the consequences are going to be, we're going to be with this for a very, very long time because, you know, it's something that I harp on all the time is, you know, where's the rules-based order? You say it all the time, but now we look at your behavior. So what, why do, what, what kind of moral authority are you in the world? And, and the West is going to pay, is paying a, 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 a huge price for this right now. The anger, I, I don't think people, when you're insulated from all of this, I don't think people understand it. I mean, um, you know, George and I don't put um, uh, put everything into polls, but I mean, you know, people under the age of 35 in the United States have a very different opinion of what's going on, That's which true. really is an amazing thing of the breakdown of uh, Israeli propaganda. Um, That's true, uh, but I think that people like Cameron, they're gonna walk away with millions. I mean, he, you know, he leaves office, you know, he'll he'll get another, you know, big fat paying job, just like um, um, Tony Blair did. You know, has Tony Blair paid any price for the Iraq? Debacle? Well, I, 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 not personally, but I think his, his his legacy is is more than tarnished. I mean, he, he's, he's a pretty yeah. trashed guy. OK, he's like, like he doesn't care because he's no. still pocketing. OK, so he's, he's made a lot of money. I mean, Obama, did Obama pay any kind of a price for Libya? No, he just said, well, it's all somebody else's fault. You know, that's what everything is always somebody else's fault. Um, I think, you know, the, the pro that's the problem with all the, these leaders. They never really pay a price because once they leave office, their fate, not just they, they don't just make a lot of money. They're fated and celebrated. They're always collecting prizes. They're collecting some award. You know, any moment, you know, oh, let's give Hillary Clinton some kind of a prize. You know, so, you know so, it, somebody it, somewhere is giving Hillary Clinton a prize right now. I, I can be sure it, of that. Isn't it really interesting how Nikki Haley, um, with her uh, uh, fat um, uh, Czech donors, they have uh, essentially completely rehabilitated uh, Bush Cheney. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, she she's the new face of the Bush Cheney. That's right. Uh, yeah. Mentality. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it, it, it remarkably okay. And very few people actually want to point that out. No, okay. No, no, but, it, but that's it, the reality of it all. No, I, I see your point. These you know accountability because who uh, keeps um, who uh, is the who are the people that hold other people accountable? Well, they're in this. They're the same milieu of people. Okay, so they're never going to do that. Okay, but you know, with somebody, you know, George W. Bush in the minds of a lot of people, he's a war criminal. Um, 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 Tony Blair, he's a war criminal. So um, you're right. The elites will protect themselves, yeah. but you know, when you go a few layers down, it can be a very different thing. Does it matter? No. No. Yeah. Yeah, oh, George, George had to spoil our Sunday. <laughs> Cameron and Annalena Fairbach. <laughs> Shame on you, George. <laughs> oh, I'm I got like ten feet of snow outside, so I, I you know I, I'm I'm willing to go through this uh, torture with uh with you. Did you see Buddy there? I don't know what Buddy found. Okay, yeah, anyway, anyway, uh, that's our Sunday wrap um, for this week. Um, uh, uh, hopefully it won't be David Cameron and Annalena Baerbach next week. Um, I'm not sure if George and I, we're going to have to check bases. We're going to do it because it's getting close to the holidays. But uh, this is The Gaggle with Peter and George. We're on local, so please go to thegaggle.locals.com. And since it is Sunday, George's first live stream is just that much closer. Exactly. So Tuesday, 3 p.m. Eastern time, please join me. Come with comments, criticisms, and suggestions on the way out the door. You know, you dip your hand in your uh, pocket, see if you've got any change there, because Buddy's saying, yeah, I'm thinking of making a comeback. I mean, if, if Cameron can do it, I, I can do it. And, and he's making a comeback. He's, he's, Come back he's to it. Yeah, he's days. recovered from his surgery. He's almost okay. Hard. And and he's thinking, well, what did I come back for? I mean, the tip jar is in, in as dismal a condition as when I left it. So, you know, we don't want him feeling despondent like that. So. You know, make sure, you know, if you have any bob in your pocket, whip them out, dunk them in his um, tip jar. Um, we're very grateful for all of your help, friendship and support. The more you're able to donate, the more of these videos we can make, the more uh, we can improve on the technology. And above all, we can lift Buddy's spirits. You know, think, yeah, it's, it was worth coming back. So remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share and subscribe. See you soon. Bye.